Welcome back, knuckleheads. I am Lupine Fiasco. This is Daily Fab Gameplay. Today, we're playing Kale versus Phi. For anyone who's new to the channel, welcome to the jungle. What we do here is review replays of games that I played on the Talishar client days or weeks ago, after enough time has passed that I lose my bias and can more objectively judge the quality of my play. I'll talk through turn cycles as if I were taking them now, comparing that to what I did then at the time of recording. We either learn from my mistakes or reinforce good play patterns with the overall goal of tightening and optimizing our gameplay in the future to take down paper events like the upcoming ProQuest season and, most importantly, walk away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. If you'd like to check out the list I'm playing here or try it for yourself on Talishar, there is a Fabry deck link in the video description below. While you're down there, if you've not already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. A YouTube subscription is the best free way to support me and to make sure that you see daily fab gameplay in your video feed five days a week. The best paid way to support me is through Patreon, and a Patreon link is also in the video description. A Patreon subscription will get you access to the DFG Discord. At higher tiers, your name will appear in every DFG video. You'll get bonus DFG content every week, and there are even more benefits coming down the pipeline. Daily Fab gameplay will always be free five days a week, so for those who can afford to patronize me, I truly appreciate it. Let's talk about the uh, KO Phi matchup and how we're sideboarding for it. Having lost the die roll, we will be going second. Uh, I fundamentally disagree with that. Yes, it feels bad when KO plays a cast bonus on turn one, but it is extremely unlikely to happen, and as this is an aggro matchup, tempo is very important, and getting tempo easily by going second is a strong way to start, but hey, I won't complain about it. As far as how we are sideboarding against Phi, in this game I'm bringing in Heart and Cross Trap. In my current iteration of the deck, I do not run Heart and Cross Trap, so I would have no choice but to bring in Fandal Spring Tunic. That said, I still think that Tunic is the correct play. KO, even with the number of non-blocks in his deck, can play defensively enough against Phi that we will get multiple activations out of Tunic. It blocks one, and the resource it gives fits very well into our standard line of pitch a blue, play pulping or wild ride, use Tunic, mandible claw. As far as the 60 that we are bringing into this matchup, we are racing. This list runs uh, 12 non-blocks, nine of which have go again. We also have Enlightened Strike. So we aren't intending to do a lot of blocking. We are intending to race Phi, dealing enough damage to keep up with his pace while we look for a Blood Rush Bellow uh, and keeping scowling flesh bag available to disrupt any five bigger turns in more recent iterations of the build i believe there is more of an argument to be made for cutting cast bones um in my current iteration i don't run cast bones against phi because very often you just can't give him a turn to set up uh, if you are giving phi a turn to set up and giving him a five card hand he is going to run with it. The same goes for Katsu, for Dash IO. Um, not so much for the Brute Mirror, but definitely against Ninja. You cannot give them a turn off, so I do cut Cast Bones. That's about it. Uh, this is an aggro matchup. Phi is not doing anything particularly troublesome. He can do a lot of damage, but for the most part, it is all face up. He is not Katsu, where blocking any particular chain link is more important than blocking anything else. Uh, if he's running Mask Momentum, that is one thing. We'll see in a minute if he is on Pouncing Links. If your fight is on Pouncing Links, you can do math to determine how much damage does a Pouncing Links Lava Burst do, or Assault the Wound. Can I afford to block and play around Tenacity? But for the most part, fight is face up. So you'll know very early how much damage you can expect Phi to do and you can block around that. But let's jump into the game and we will see how that all comes together. We see that Phi is on Mask of the Pouncing Lynx, so uh, we will need to do some math. 
unfortunately. You know, it does happen. Rising Resentment for three, we will block this with Assault and Battery, I guess would be our uh, best card to block with, as it is the worst card in our hand. We're hoping that Phi can't go much wider than that. Um, having two Pulpings, our hand does not block well, so we are going to block the Ember Blade. Uh, if Phi can follow up with Phoenix Flame, Ronin Renegade, Lava Burst, we're going to take a lot of damage this turn. So we are just hoping to weather the storm. This is the downside of playing so many non-blocks in a deck, is sometimes you do just draw hands that are non-functional on defense. Fi here playing Rise from the Ashes to pick up the Phoenix Flame. The Phoenix Flame will come in for four with the Tiger Stripe Shuko. Of course, we cannot block. Uh, so we will at least be starting this game at 35. Thankfully, Fi does not have the Snatch follow-up, as that would have been very bad for us. For our turn, we are just going to open with Red Pulping. Pitching our, I would say, Reincarnate. I think at this point in my KO career, I was really focused on I want my Reincarnate value, which of course doesn't matter uh, in an aggro matchup like Phi, we are not going to fatigue. So here I would have liked to keep the Smash Instinct as let's say we were not interested in playing this Yellow Pulping. We could pitch Yellow Pulping to attack with Claw, then we could pitch our second blue to play Smash Instinct, which is potentially very troublesome for Phi to deal with. Um, so this was pitched incorrectly. And very often which blue you pitch won't matter, because of course you're hoping to discard your extra blues to draw reds. But in a situation where maybe you do keep a bunch of blues in hand, having a smash instinct or riled up at the end of a chain is a lot more important than getting your reincarnate triggers. That said, the follow-up for this pulping is kind of junky. Uh, we could pitch a blue, attack with claw, attack with pulping, maximize our damage. The problem with doing that is that we are then getting a random card off the top of our deck to put into arsenal. Probably a better call. But if it is a third blue, if we draw another blue off the top of our deck, we're really unexcited to have it in our arsenal. That said, our alternative this turn is playing a salt and battery and pitching reincarnate, then arsenaling a pulping. Yes, we get a go again attack into our arsenal. Yes, there is no chance of getting a bad blue into our arsenal, but we are also missing out on three damage. In this turn cycle, which as KO in an aggro mirror, it's pretty unacceptable. So I think this is a fine line as well. This is actually the correct line because the pull thing could have drawn us a two cost red uh, that we would then be able to follow up with. As it is, that didn't happen, so we are still coming in for just eight with our claw. We are going to arsenal. I guess one of our better blues, but uh, at this point, I'm not excited to arsenal any of the blues in my deck. I'll do it, because having a bad blue in arsenal is, in my opinion, better than having no arsenal, but man, that really sucks. Not blocking the blue, Rising Resentment. At this point, uh, being the first link on the chain, Rising Resentment has no text and one point of damage is really not something that I'm concerned about. Am I looking to block with this hand at all? Uh, at this point, not really. I would like to discard wind up at the end of Phi's turn. On my turn, I can play swing big for nine with go again. I can then use heart and cross strap to attack with pulping if I so chose. Um, blocking with this hand isn't the worst thing. We do have a swing big that I could block with. I can then discard Agile Windup to make Might and Agility. I can attack with Pulping. I could attack with Assault and Battery from Arsenal and Arsenal a Pulping. Um, I'm not going to block this Ember Blade. I'm going to wait for Phi to do something else that is more threatening. But I just bring this up to say there are things we can do with this hand. We could also just attack with a Pulping. 
Pitch a blue, hope to draw, then discard something. Keep our blue and our swing big and attack with claw swing big. If I would have to do something pretty impressive for me to want to block with this hand. This may be enough to force me to block, uh, considering that Phi still has Mask of the Pouncing Lynx, a card in hand and a card in arsenal. What I may want to do here is block with Flesh Bag and Scab Skin. Take this card out of Phi's hand, depending on what Phi has in the arsenal. Um, he may not have much of a turn left. If it's, a, say, another Blaze Headlong, we could block with a Swing Big and an Apex Bone Breaker. Um, all we know about this card is that Phi chose to arsenal it instead of attack with it when he could pretty reasonably assume that we didn't have anything in our hand that blocked. So rather than get free damage, he chose to keep it. Could be a finisher. Could also be a zero for three. We know it probably isn't a snatch. Uh, I do think that blocking with flesh bag and scab skin is the best way to mitigate what's happening to us. Um, but it is totally defensible to not do that. My thought was just, this is a great four card hand. I would like to keep it. At this point, we are more or less committed to not keeping this hand. So what does that mean for blocking here? I think for blocking this, our best line is to block with the swing big. On our turn, we play Assault and Battery from Arsenal and Arsenal Pulping. It's a bad turn, but we have a bad blue and our Arsenal, and at some point we need to get rid of it. Instead of choosing not to block, uh, I'm interested to see how I'm going to use this hand. If my idea is to play pulping, pitch the windup, and just cross trap into swing big, um, I am going to get to do that. You can see sort of why I'm put off of cross trap. Um, worth noting that Tunic would not be online here. But if Tunic was online, Tunic is objectively better than Crosstrap in this situation. We still get to play a swing big, but we get to keep our Tunic uh, to continue generating resources for us later. So we do just throw a bunch of damage at Phi, which Phi takes. We still have our Flesh Bag, which we are going to use. We draw into a Blood Rush Bellow with a blue in hand. So, not... Uh, offended about just throwing a flesh bag in front of this rising resentment and trying to mitigate some damage. Considering that we still have this terrible blue in our arsenal and that we cannot afford to give Phi time, uh, I really am thinking we're gonna throw this Blood Rush Bellow, even with not having agility, not having a pulping or a wild ride. We are just going to do it and try to pressure Phi off of killing us. So that being the case, I think that putting Flesh Bag and uh, Apex in front of this Roman Renegade may be the ideal call. Uh, we take away Phi's opportunity to Pouncing Links away from uh, a hit. Definitely putting Flesh Bag in front of the Renegade. I think we just mitigate whatever Phi is going to do. If we can take his blue, that might shut down his turn entirely. Um, taking a blue or this Flame Call Awakening would have been really strong. I appreciate wanting to save the Flesh Bag for when I know it's going to have value. But considering that Phi is a 12, he is within lethal range. And that we need to put him under pressure to make sure that he can't put another 5 card hand together. I'm a big fan of just throwing the flesh bag as a means of staying alive. And here we're in a position where Phi has two Phoenix Flames in hand. The flesh bag doesn't do anything anymore. Um, yes, it takes a Phoenix Flame away from Phi, but he is going to be able to activate his hero power, so he's still getting a Shuko trigger. The flesh bag prevents one point of damage this turn. One additional point. Uh, plus it's two block value. So what I might want to do is just put the flesh bag 
and the bone breaker in front of the flame call so that we mitigate the damage and we take away a chain link for salt the wound but we're really kicking ourselves for not using this flesh bag earlier thinking about an art of war maybe Fi could do something maybe we want to save it for when we know that Fi is going to have a really strong uh offensive option that we can hit with the uh flesh bag but if we had taken that blue Fi's turn kind of just ends if we took a flame call awakening we are mitigating a lot of damage um and instead Fi is getting to play out this entire turn. So considering uh, if we want to use Fleshbag here, Fleshbag is going to take away this Phoenix Flame. Fi can still pick up and play a Phoenix Flame from discard. He is going to get his Shuko Trigger with uh, whatever he finds for Mask of the Pouncing Lynx or whatever this card in is in his arsenal. Choosing not to give Scabskin Leathers here I think is totally reasonable. Uh, we could have blocked with Apex as well. We're just really expecting that whatever this is in Fi's arsenal is going to be able to trigger the uh, Pouncing Links. And that we really just don't want to block if we can avoid it. So we are going to give up our Savage Feast here. We are going to make a Might. We are going to keep this three card Blood Rush hand, which is still fine. And we're going to see what Fi has in the arsenal. Just being a snatch, totally fine. Um, seeing that if we had blocked the Phoenix Flame with a Bone Breaker, we could have blocked the Snatch as well to prevent the Pouncing Links. Uh, so in hindsight, yeah, blocking that Phoenix Flame actually would have been a good idea. I was just thinking, oh, it's a Lava Burst or a Salt or something. So I think retroactively we could have absolutely played that turn better 100 percent as it is happening now uh we're going to play the second blood rush battle and really just hope for the best we're really looking for a blue and a two cost and you know what we found them so having a uh, a pretty solid turn lined up here we are going to get to claw uh this will be nine with go again We'll follow up with a Polting for 9 with Go again, very likely having Dominate as well. Fi choosing not to block the Claw means that he is just dead unless he has a Defense Reaction. Uh, only able to cover 6 with Armor and a card from hand is going to steal us a win. Uh, that said, I don't know that we entirely deserved that win. We played out some solid turn cycles, uh, both players dealing quite a lot of, uh, accruing quite a lot of value per turn, but we really misplayed that last turn from Phi. Uh, an early flesh bag would have mitigated so much of that damage and put us in such a better position to win the game, potentially keep a four card blood rush hand instead of a three card. Would have given us more resources to play with but uh, this was definitely an earlier KO game, and something I've learned a lot since then is the flashback does not have to be this incredible silver bullet to whatever your opponent is trying to do. The flashback can absolutely be, my hand is good, and I want to make sure I'm not dead before I can play it. We aren't thinking we're going to hit Fi's blue, or we're going to hit his flame call, or we're going to hit whatever the combo piece is. We're thinking Fi is really good with five card hand, so let's make it a four card hand and just hope for the best. Sometimes you do get lucky. Sometimes you're playing against Hatchet's Dorinthia and you hit their only Blade Runner and their turn ends. Sometimes you do hit the Fi's Lava Burst or Salt the Wound and he can't double finish your, you anymore. But sometimes you just hit a Rising Resentment or a Ronin Renegade and like, that was relevant. And now I'm not dead. Now I don't have to block with the fourth card. And I can keep a four card blood rush. So really, just a preemptive let's not die flesh bag that turn would have made a huge difference in the outcome of that game. We ended up not needing it, but we also drew extremely well at the end of that game. And we very easily could have drawn much worse. Uh, we also absolutely could have blocked better around that last Phoenix Flame. 
I was anticipating a better finisher from Fi's arsenal, but just that snatch, we would have given up the same number of cards that we gave up to block anyway, and Fi would not have been able to use Mask of the Pouncinglings. That does keep him alive through our pulping, but it also means that Pouncinglings got two value instead of eight. That's really good for us. So I certainly learned something from watching this game back. I hope you did too. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, take that like button to Pound Town. My comments are always open for any questions or feedback. Again, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. It's free. It helps me out a lot. But no matter what you do, catch me back here tomorrow for more daily fab gameplay. And until then, take care.